Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm A.J. Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. That audiobook is free, by the way. Go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com slash book. EffortlessEnglishClub.com slash book. Get my audiobook for free. The whole audiobook. It's worth $20. I'm giving it to you for free. My gift to you. EffortlessEnglishClub.com slash book. Enjoy it. Speaking of books, today we have a book club lesson. Starting a new book today, Dumbing Us Down by John Taylor Gatto. This is a book about schooling and education. This guy's powerful. He's very powerful. He's a powerful writer. He's giving, he gives us a really big, strong, powerful red pill in chapter one. Right in the beginning. Live on Facebook, as usual, with the book club. Just want to say hi to everybody. Hello, everyone's saying hello. Oh, there's Fernanda. Hey, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Lots of people saying hello from lots of places. Brazil, Poland, etc. Okay, good. Wonderful. Let's get started. Powerful, powerful. Chapter one, John Taylor Gatto. He was a teacher. He was a teacher in the school system, New York school system. And he, he, got in, uh, he got an award for being the best teacher in all of New York. That's a lot of people in New York. New York's a very big state. So that's impressive. Even more impressive. They, uh, they gave him this award and he gave a speech when he got the award. And chapter one, this is the speech he gave to the group. <laughs> and why I'm laughing is because, you know, usually this kind of speech, they'll go and they'll say, oh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for making me the best teacher of the year. Thank you. Oh, thank you to my students and blah, 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 blah. Boring, boring. What he did, he came and he gave them a red pill. One big, big red pill. He did not come and say nice things to them. Them, this is, these are like, you know, politicians and other people who gave him the award. He came and he told the truth, the hard truth about school. And he knows it because he was a teacher teaching inside the school systems. So basically he came and his speech basically said, being a school teacher is evil and bad. And what I have, what I'm doing, what my job is, is bad and evil. And he says, I'm going to tell you the truth about my job, being a teacher in a school. And then he gives the speech that we will now learn in chapter one. So, hey, number one, I give him, I, I clap, I give him thumbs up for uh, having a lot of guts. Guts means he's brave, he's strong. Right? He wasn't afraid. He went in there. He told the truth to these people. I'm sure his audience did not like hearing this speech. The people he was speaking to probably were shocked about what he was saying. Shocked because he was telling the hard truth. So let's learn the hard truth. Because I agree with every single thing he says in this chapter. I love this guy, John Taylor Gatto. Love him, love him, love him. That's why I chose this book. This is a great book. And what I like about it, too, his writing style, he doesn't try to be polite, doesn't try to be nice, he doesn't try to be soft. He's mm, boom! He just hits you with the big punches, he gives you those red pills, and he's like, he just gives you the hard truth, straight and direct. Let's learn it. The Seven Lesson School Teacher is the name of chapter one. He said, he's, he starts, he says, I've been teaching school for 30 years. That's a long time. So he knows the school system very, very well. 
He says he has a degree. He's cert a cert certified to teach English. Oh, so like me, teach the English language and teach English literature. So another similarity to me. But then he says, I don't teach English. I have a certificate to teach English. That's supposed to be my job. That's my title. But I don't teach English. I teach school. I teach school. What does he mean by that? I teach school. Well, let's learn. What does he mean? I don't teach English. He says, I teach school. He says, I, in fact, I teach seven lessons. There are seven lessons that I teach and that every school teacher teaches. These are the real lessons taught in school. Number one, school teaches confusion. Confusion. This is the first lesson taught in schools. This is what teachers teach you in schools. Confusion, right? It means you don't understand. It's the opposite of understanding. Confusion. He says, I teach disconnections. Disconnections. I teach too much. And then he gives a big list of all the things taught in schools. The orbiting of the planets, the law of numbers, slave, slavery, adjectives, architecture, dance, gymnasium, singing, uh, fire drills, computer languages, parents' nights, and goes on and on and on and on and on. And then what he says is, what do any of these things have to do with each other? So what he's saying is this, that in schools, nothing's connected. The children are confused because they just get all these facts, all this information, but none of it is connected to each other. It's just, it's almost random. And this is super, super, super confusing to the kids. He says, none of these things are connected. And that is completely unnatural. That is a very unnatural way of learning. It's like today's audio podcast. You probably haven't listened to it, but today's audio podcast, I just uploaded it today. And in today's audio podcast, I talk about natural learning and I talk about exactly this, how in natural learning, everything's connected. So the child, if we're talking about children, it's all true for adults too, but for children, they get, they're curious about something. This is the starting point. They're curious about something. They're interested in something and they focus on that one thing and they try to learn about it, look at it, learn about it. Let's say bugs. And they start getting crazy about bugs, 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 bugs. And they focus on that for a long time. That might be one day, a full day. Um, could be months. It could be years. Who knows? But they focus on that. But then what happens is they naturally will learn or get curious about something else that's connected to bugs. They focus on bugs for a while. But then while they're looking at bugs, then suddenly they, they notice... Um, I don't know, maybe they notice plants. And then they start getting interested in plants because plants are connected to bugs, right? The bugs are crawling around on the plants. So first the kid's interested in the bugs. Then maybe they get interested in the plants. Then they get interested in the dirt. Then they get interested in the earth. Then they get interested in, I don't know, rain and weather. And right, they, there's these connections. So they follow these connections. Their curiosity goes from one topic to another, to another, to another, because they're all connected very naturally. That's natural learning, natural connections, right? The, lear the, the learning is always connected. Everything they learn is connected to something else. That's natural learning. In school, nothing's connected. The kids go to English class, they learn English. Maybe they study Shakespeare. Then after one hour, it doesn't matter if they're interested. Maybe they want to continue to read Shakespeare. Maybe they love it. Doesn't matter. After one hour, ding, they have to get up and leave. Doesn't matter if they're interested or not. They have to leave after one hour. And then they get up and they go to the next class. And then in the next class, they study, I don't know, you know, chemistry. And the chemistry is not connected to Shakespeare at all. There's zero connection between the classes. Zero connection between the topics. And it's just this way, random, random, random. Even inside each class, right? They'll learn in an English class. They'll study Shakespeare, Henry V. And then after they finish Henry V, then they read something by, I don't know, Emily Dickinson. Something completely different, not connected to Shakespeare at all. Completely unconnected to Shakespeare. 
So it's all unconnected, and this is super confusing. It's not natural. It's very, very, very unnatural, completely unnatural way to learn. And he's, he mentions that the, another reason schools are so confusing is that all of the adults working in the school, the teachers and the other people, they don't work together. They're all working alone. They're all separate. They're not, right? They're not connected either. The English teacher and the math teacher, they don't make plans together. They, they completely teach separately. So again, what they're teaching is completely 100% unconnected, which is very unnatural. It's not human. He also says there's really no natural logical order or connections to how things are taught in school, to the topics, that really it's a crazy system, that the system is crazy. There's no real reason for the, reason, for the things that are taught and why they're taught and when they're taught. It's all almost random. And then he makes a statement that this disconnection, it's not only the topics, that the worst thing, the worst thing that teachers do, the worst thing that school does, the whole system, because he's talking about the whole system, not individual teachers. He was a teacher. He's talking about the whole system of school. The worst thing it does is it disconnects children from their families. It disconnects children from their parents. And then he says, it's a strong sentence. He says, home is only a ghost because both parents work. And school eats all of the children's time. So the home, the family is weakened, right? The family becomes a ghost, half dead. All right, the second thing that schools teach, class position, class position, right? This is ordering, right? Somebody's above someone else. Schools always, they put the students in different orders, right? They, they give tests to the students, and there's the top one, and then the second, and third, and fourth, and fifth, all the way down. And then also, they do it by age, right? There's first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. They don't mix. They're kept separate according to age. So all the children are numbered. And what this teaches is it teaches the children that they have a specific place, that they have to be controlled, he's saying. Because it means you're in second grade. You can't go to third grade and learn something from them. Why not? I don't know. What if the second grade child is very smart or just curious and is curious about something in the third grade? Maybe they're smart enough. They could handle it. They could learn. They could understand some things in third grade. But they're not allowed to go to the third grade and learn something or fourth grade. Or they're not allowed to go back down to the first grade and learn something that they like Either they're not allowed, right? There is just this little ordered system. They're like in a little box, and they are they're forced to stay in this one room, this one grade, this one class, at least for elementary school. And then he says, as a teacher, he lied to the students all the time, always lying to the students. And one of the biggest lies is they tell the students they would lie to the students constantly, especially the like high school students. They would lie and tell them that. They had to focus on their grades and test scores because of getting a job. They said that in the future, when they're adults, the employers, the companies will look at their grades and will look at their test scores. And this will determine, this will decide if they can get a job. And this will decide if they make more money. And he said, in my own experience, that is a lie. It's not true. Most employers... Most people who hire people, most companies, don't care about that stuff. Most companies don't care about test scores. Most companies don't care about grades. And he's right. He's 100% right. They don't care. Good Lord. It's, it, it's, it's a lie. It's a straight lie. It's a, but it's a way to control and scare the students so they'll do what they're told. And then he makes a very strong statement. Truth and school teaching are incompatible. It means they are basically opposite. If you teach school, you must lie. 
The schools are systems of lying. And if you want to be honest, then you must go against the schools. I told you, he, he's, he's strong. He, he, he says everything very strongly and directly. And he said Socrates, the great Greek philosopher, thousands of years ago, Socrates said exactly the same thing, that school teaching and truth are the opposite. Number three, number three, indifference. Schools teach children to be indifferent. Indifferent means don't care. Don't care. Not it, you say, eh, if, you're, if you are indifferent, it means eh, you don't care. You don't care about anything. You just don't care. Eh, eh. Another, another word with the same meaning is apathy. Apathy. Apathy, indifference means not caring about anything, really. Not caring about anything. And he says, schools teach children not to care about anything. And he gives the example of the system of classes. This is more for older, like middle and high school, with the bells again, the schedule, right? So let's say maybe every 45 minutes, there's a bell rings. Bring, and then the students have to get up and then they go to another class and study a different subject. Or in some schools, the, the, the students stay there and the, the teachers change. But the idea is, he says, think about it. When the bell rings... I force the children to stop whatever they are doing. They must immediately stop anything they're doing. This is actually true for elementary too, actually. It's all school. They must immediately stop what they're doing and then go and study something else that's new. He's like, that is, that is teaching them not to care because it doesn't matter. What if they're doing something and they're super, super interested? They're super excited. It doesn't matter. They have to immediately stop when the bell bring and then change. So maybe they're reading a book. They love it. They just want to continue reading this book. Read, read, read. Maybe they want to read for two hours or three hours because they're so excited. They're so interested in the book. It doesn't matter. In school, English class is finished. You must stop reading now and then go to math class. So it's teaching them. He says they learn, they learn that they must turn on and off like a light. That they're, they're, they're not in control of their own learning. Their curiosity is not important. What they want is not important. It's only what the teacher and the school say. When the, school's, when the school and the teacher say, you, have, you must stop and now do something else, then immediately they must obey. And so they learn that nothing is really important because nothing is ever finished. Nothing important is ever finished in school. He says the lesson of the bells, the lesson of moving from class to class is that no work is worth finishing, that it's not important to finish your work. So why care? Why care about anything? Why care? Because it doesn't matter, right? If you're super excited reading a book, doesn't matter. Why should you get excited about it? Because in one hour you have to stop. It doesn't matter doesn't matter if you like it. It doesn't matter if you really want to continue. Nope, you must stop. Now you must go study math. You must just obey what the teacher says. So why care about it? And, you know, I can remember, I, th this is how I felt in school. It's amazing because it, I was exactly this way. I remember I hated every single book that I read in school. And let's just say, we're talking about high school. So I can re remember, you know, every book that I was forced to read in school with this kind of system, right? Where I'd have to read for a while and then class is over eh, and then go. And then, of course, they also make the kids write stupid papers about these books or take a test about the books. So I just hated the books. I hated it. I was just like, this is, this is horrible. I hate this stuff. It's boring. They're, they, they killed my natural desire to read those books. I, would, I hated those books, anything in school. I had other books I read by myself that I enjoyed, but I hated anything in school. But what's interesting is then later in life, I, I did go back and I read some books from school. For example, Walden. Walden is a book that American kids read a lot in school by Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau. And when reading it as an adult outside of the school system, I love the book. I loved it. I realized this book is fantastic. I love, love. It's one of my favorite books, perhaps my favorite book. But, I, 
But the school killed any desire, curiosity, or enjoyment of that book for me. Only when I left school could I finally enjoy it. And that was true for every single book. Same for Shakespeare. I hated Shakespeare in school. Horrible. Now I see it's, it's genius. Okay, number four, what do schools teach? Number four, the fourth lesson they teach, emotional dependency. This basically means emotional weakness. Weakness, emotional weakness. Interesting. Let's see what he says about that. Oh, let's go in a little detail here, sorry. Emotional dependency. Oh, this means he's saying that um, the students learn to depend on the teacher, right? They learn to fear the teacher getting angry, criticizing them, and giving bad grades. And they also learn to try to please the teacher, please the teacher, so they get good grades, right? On a test, don't answer honestly on the test. That's the bad thing to do. No, just tell the teacher what the teacher wants. Just answer on this test what you know the teacher wants to hear, right? So you just, you, you, the schools teach kids just to please the teacher, to please the boss, to please the authority. Don't be honest. Don't be truthful. Number five, intellectual dependency. So intellectual weakness. So last, number four was emotional. This one is intellectual. And this is the, this first sentence is powerful. Good students wait for a teacher to tell them what to do. If I had to choose one sentence to describe why schools are evil, that might be the sentence. Good students wait for a teacher to tell them what to do. This is the most important lesson of them all. We must wait for other people, better trained people than us, better people than us, experts, to tell us the meaning of our lives. Ooh. Wow. Indeed, indeed. Indeed, indeed. This is the most important lesson of them all that te schools teach the children just to wait. Don't be the boss of your own learning. Don't follow your curiosity. No, no, no. You must wait until the teacher tells you what to do. Don't do something yourself. Don't make a decision yourself. No, no, no. You got to wait. Don't just go get a book and start reading yourself because it looks interesting. No, no, no. You have to wait for the teacher to tell you which book to read, how many pages to read, write how to do a paper. Don't just go read for fun. Don't study beetles because you think bugs are interesting. No, no, no. That's not in the book today. That's not what we're studying. You have to wait for the teacher to tell you what to study. You have to wait for the teacher to tell you what to focus on. And what this trains people to do when they become adults is to wait for someone else, some expert, some boss, some politician to tell you what's meaningful, to tell you what's important so you don't decide yourself. So you don't take action yourself. You're always waiting, waiting, waiting. So when you're at a job, you wait for a boss to tell you what to do. If you see a problem, you don't just solve it. You wait to be told what to do. And he says, curiosity is, is not important, only conformity. In school, curiosity is not important, only conformity. Conformity means follow the rules, do what you are told. And I think, I believe that is the center of what schools are about, teaching conformity, and that's all. Just follow the rules. doesn't matter if the rules are bad or good, evil or good, doesn't matter. The lesson of schools is follow the rules, do what the teacher says. Curiosity is not important. You're not important. And then, you know, again, he says it a different way. He says, good people wait for an expert to tell them what to do. Good people wait for an expert to tell them what to do. I was uh, in an audio podcast a couple days ago. I read a quote from the book. It's called the Dhammapada. And the, the quote is basically, only you can be your own master. Only you can do it. 
You must be the master of your own life. Only you can do it. Now, others can give you ideas. Others can give you advice. You can read books and get help and all of that. But in the end, only you can do it for you. Only you can be the master of your own life. Only you can master your own mind. No one else can do it for you. No one else can do it. It's the opposite of what the schools teach. The schools teach, oh, wait for someone else to tell you. Wait for, they're the master and you have to wait. Wait for the expert to tell you. But that's the exact opposite of the truth, which is the truth is only you can do it. Only you can do it. You are the expert of your own life. You and only you are the master of your own mind, right? But no one else can be. Only you can do it. Okay, number six, the lesson. Provisional self-esteem. Provisional is a little difficult word. Let me see what the dictionary definition of provisional is. I may have a better arrangement for the present, possibly to be changed later. Yeah, right. Um, provisional, how do I explain provisional? It basically means uh, uh, like changeable, changeable self-esteem. Self-esteem means self-confidence, right? You feel good about yourself. So changeable self-esteem. It means you don't just feel good about yourself all the time. You're not confident all the time. Schools teach you not to be confident all the time. He says, I teach children that self-respect, confidence, depends on expert opinions. So again, it's, it's the same idea. He's saying that schools teach children, don't just feel confident. No, you have to wait. Your confidence comes from the teacher. If the teacher gives you an A and a good grades, okay, then you can feel good. But if the teacher gives you an F, then you have to feel bad. It doesn't depend on inside you. It's not about you. It's not about your own mind. It's about what the teacher tells you or the school tells you. Your confidence depends on outside people. This is the lesson. So, of course, when people grow up out after school, and they become adults, they still have this problem where they look outside for confidence. They're looking outside for confidence instead of finding it inside. And he says that's the purpose of grades and tests and report cards. Right? He says that all major uh, philosophy systems, if you look at history, so if you look at like Greek philosophy, ancient Greek philosophy, if you look at the, uh, the history of, you know, Buddhist philosophy, uh, Christian, Muslim, whatever, it doesn't matter. If you look at these philosophical systems, one of the most important things is that you evaluate yourself, right? The self-knowledge, you must know yourself, right? There's a, it's a super famous phrase, know yourself, know thyself is another way to say it in old English, but in modern English, we would say, know yourself. And all of these philosophies and religions teach this as very important, that, it, that to be wise, to be a good person, to understand the world, anything, to be successful, that you, one of the first steps is you must know yourself. You must know yourself. So you must be able to look at yourself. You must be able to see your own weaknesses see your own strengths, right? You know yourself well, and you know, I, you know, I have these problems. I have these weaknesses. I have these strengths. That's where confidence and wisdom, that's how you become a better person and smarter. You have to know yourself. So you know yourself. You make those decisions about yourself. Am I doing well? Am I not doing well? Am I learning? Am I not learning? You have to learn how to do that. Super important. But he's saying schools teach you not to do that. Schools teach you that self-knowledge is not important. You don't grade yourself. You don't decide for yourself, oh, I, I'm learning, I'm improving with, uh, I don't know, with English, right? No, no, no. The, only the teacher in the school, they decide. They give you a grade. They give you a test. It's their opinion that's important, not yours. That's dangerous. It's dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. I agree with him because, you know, like as an adult, right, learning English, Sometimes people ask me, AJ, you know, do you have a test? No. No, you decide. You, you're, you decide if you are improving with English. You're smart. You know. You know, right? 
You know. That's why you came to Effortless English. You were trying old methods and not improving. And you knew it. You looked at yourself and you realized, self-knowledge, my English is not good, it's not improving. I need to do something differently. And you searched and you maybe you tried different things and you're using Effortless English. And then again, I'm, I don't, you don't need a paper from me. You don't need a grade from me. That means nothing. Something from me means nothing. You know. You know. How do you know? Because you listen and you understand better. Because you talk to somebody and your speaking is better. It's self-evaluation, self-knowledge. You are the master and you decide for yourself, ah, I'm improving. I'm getting better. I see it. I know it. I feel it. That's real evaluation, that you're learning to trust yourself. You're the master of yourself. You're the master of your own English learning. That's fantastic. Well, that we must teach children that. We should be teaching children that with everything. But schools don't. They teach the opposite. They teach children, your opinion is not important. Only the teacher's opinion is important. Only the school's opinion is important. Not your parents and not you. Terrible, terrible. Can you tell I'm emotional about this topic? I love this topic. I love this guy. I love this book. I love it. I want to say amen after every sentence. <laughs> All right. Last one. Uh, last lesson, number seven. You can't hide. You can't hide. He says, schools teach students. Students that they are always watched. Yeah, this is true. This is like 1984. It's like Animal Farm, really. I mean, if you think about a school, a public school, it is a little bit like Animal Farm, right? This, especially this part. We teach students that they are always watched. They're always under surveillance. It means people watching them by teachers and by, you know, other workers. There are no private spaces for children. There is no private time, no privacy. It's true. In schools, there's no privacy. They're always being watched, 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 watched. They never have any time to just be themselves alone, do anything. Even when they, if they have time, a lot of schools, there's no time to play. But if, when I was a kid, they had playtime still. And, but even then, you know, the, everybody's watching us all the time. All the adults watching, 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 right? They're spying on you. They're watching you all the time, all the time. It's not natural. It's really unhealthy. When I went home and played with my friends, I, we would just play and play outside. Nobody watching us at all. Just had lots of fun. But in school, watching, watching, always watched. And today, now... It's much worse than when I was a child. It was already bad when I was little. But now I see, you know, they've got cameras everywhere. They're watching them constantly. These poor kids never get any private time. And he says, even worse, they give homework. They call it homework so that the kids can never escape from school. They go home. They still have to do work from the school. Even at home, they're not totally free from the school. And this eats up their time, he says, right? Because at home, maybe they would learn something from their parents. Maybe they would learn something independently. But no, they have to use that extra time to do homework, use that energy to do homework. And so it kind of kills the time and energy to learn independently, even at home, because of this homework they must do. Woo! Okay, so those are the seven points. That's kind of the end of the speech. And then he makes some more points over here, which I'll talk about in a second. Let me get a drink of water first. Let's take a break. This is some heavy stuff. Now, just imagine that John Taylor Gatto, he just gave that speech, powerful and super strongly criticizing schools. He gave that to school teachers, his audience for that speech, school teachers, school administrators, school politicians. <laughs> I wish I was in the audience. It was probably silent. 
They were probably looking down at their shoes while he talked. So bless him. Bless him for telling the truth. Okay, let's do the rest of the chapter now. Next, uh, not really part of the speech. This is just some more things he talks about. He talks a little bit about the history of school in the next section. Uh, now, specifically, he's American, so he's talking about the United States. This general, the general points he's making are true for most countries in the world about the school system we have now. Most countries in the world use the same kind of school system. The history, the dates may be a little different in different countries, but the same idea. But he's going to talk specifically about the United States. He said, before the Civil War in the United States, the Civil War it was 1865, is when it, I believe when it started, 1865. So before that, in America, no school system, no public schools, no organized um, school system like we have now. Nothing like now. There, there were some schools, but they were kind of private and small. But there were many, 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 many ways of learning before the Civil War, before 1865. Before that, there was a lot. Most people learned at home from their parents. And there were also maybe like some religious schools and maybe some other kinds of schools, maybe schools focused more on farming and, and that kind of thing. There was just a huge variety of different ways to learn. But most people just learned at home from their parents. And he said it worked very, very well that uh, in early America until 1865, so about the first hundred years of America, that most of the population could read very well. He said, in fact, he says, if you look at some of the books, the kids' books from that time period, they're much more advanced than kids' books today. He says, if you look at books for children, like fifth grade, grade five, from that time period, 1865, he says, it's, it's equal to almost college level now. It just shows that how the schools have made our students stupid now and how the, that system, that old system of learning at home was so much better and that the reading level, at least, was much, 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 much higher for students and children back then. Then he says, how did they do it? How did they do it? He says, now, you know, modern parents now, they imagine, oh, Teaching children, that must be difficult. But he says the truth is, the truth is, reading, writing, and arithmetic, arithmetic is math, only take about 100 hours to teach. As long as the students are interested and wanting to learn. That's important. So he says, if, if the student, if the child is interested, they really want to learn, you only need 100 hours total, complete, only 100 hours total to teach reading, writing, and math. I don't know if he means total or one each, but either way, that's not many hours. So he says, how do you do it? He says, the trick is, the key, the key point is you wait. You don't force it on the child. Don't force it when they don't want it. You wait until they're interested. When they show they want to learn it, then boom, you jump and you do it suddenly a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, and then they learn quickly. So, for example, with reading with a child, for maybe for a while when they're young, you just read to them. You read to them, right? You have books and you, re you read and they look at the pictures. Oh, that's nice. That's nice, nice, nice. And you, you do that. Maybe every day, as long children love that. They love it. But maybe they're not quite ready to learn. You might try and see, but you wait. You just wait. You're patient. And every child's different. Some children, maybe very early, they want to learn to read themselves. But other children, maybe they, uh, they, they, they're a little more slow. They wait. Wait longer. That's all. So you just wait until they start wanting to read. And kids, they always do this. They'll, they'll say, I want to do it. I want to do it. When they do that, when they have that natural desire, that natural curiosity, it will happen. You have to be patient. But when it happens, 
boom. That's when you suddenly jump. You say, okay, great. Well, let's learn to read. And then you teach them to read. And when they want to do it, when they have that motivation, that curiosity, it happens very, very, very fast. It's easy to do. Teaching children to read is super easy. Teaching them math is easy, and teaching them to write is easy as long as you follow the natural way. It's kind of like effortless English, actually. And he also says, look, it's so easy that millions of people, millions of people just teach themselves how to do it. They don't even have a teacher. Millions of people who are, you know, older, maybe young adults or adults, teach themselves how to read. They just get a book and they, they sort of learn how to do it. Interesting, huh? Then he talks a little more about how schools have destroyed American society. Schools, because of schools that the, connect, the family connections, the, the connections between family members, the families have become weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. The schools have helped to destroy families and destroy communities. Not just families, but neighborhoods. Now everybody's separate. The children don't spend enough time with their parents anymore each day. The parents are off working, both of them, and the kids are off in school getting all these terrible lessons, and this destroys the families. Schools take our children away from community life. The schools take the child out of the natural community, out of the family, and destroy those connections. Then he finally, number three, he finally says, this is not necessary. There, there are better ways. And the main thing he says is, there is not one right way. This is one of the main things we have to realize, that schools teach us there's one right way, the school system only. But he says there are many, 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 many ways to learn. There are many, many, many ways to do education. Many, many possibilities. And that we should have lots and lots of choices. One of the great things I talked about today in the audio podcast was that um, one of the great things about teaching at home, home education, is that each child can get their own uh, independent education, and it can be different for each child. If So you don't have to do the same for all of them. right? If one child is interested in science right now, they can focus on science. If another child is wanting to just read books, they can just focus on reading for a while. You, know, you can adapt and do things differently with each child. It's pretty easy to do. And then each child is following their own way so that there should be a different way of learning and teaching for every child and for every community. And he says we should, the, we, we should help children find meaning in their families again and in their friendships and in their communities. That this is where the real meaning is, not grades and tests, but to be happy, people and to have a happy society, we must again focus on connecting children to their families, to having families stronger again, parents and their children having these close connections again so that the children are learning from their parents, the parents are mostly doing the education so that they are spending lots of time together, that that is the most important part of any society, any culture, any nation is that family, the strength of that family. And then from there also, the local community becomes strong again. And then he calls, this. I always say this too, that school is jail for children. <laughs> or another way we could say, school is prison for children. It's exactly right. right? They, have, they can't leave. They have to go. They can't leave. If they leave, they, they get in trouble. They grab them. In America, they have guards. Right? They've got fences around. They look like prisons. Schools look like prisons. They are. It's prison for children. Schools are prisons for children. And he says another, uh, another problem with this is that by putting children in schools 
for so many hours per day. They lose their connections to all adults, to their parents, but also just to adult life in general. This is very unnatural. If we look at the history of humans, children should be constantly around adults, connected to adults, so that they're seeing the adult world all the time, not separate from it. The adult world should be part of their life. He says, but because of schools now, so many young people, especially teenagers, they have no connection to the adult world. They don't respect adults. They don't respect their parents. They just want to play video games and watch television, right? Because they're completely unconnected to their parents and to adult life. They can't concentrate because of, again, schools and television. And he, he points to schools and television as the two things that have killed our Families killed our society, destroyed our childhoods, destroyed real education. I agree. He, he identified the correct two things. And he says, because of this, children grow up and many children become bullies. They become mean, cruel, materialistic, passive, unhappy, addicted to television and some addicted to drugs and things like that. He says, school teaching is destructive. It destroys children. School teaching destroys children. So he says, again, what's the better answer? He says, look, if, we, if we're talking about the United States, look at the situation before the Civil War. Before the Civil War, the American uh, citizens were very well educated, but they were mostly educated at home, it was mostly self-education, family education. And then there were other schools too, but they were kind of uh, voluntary. He says the key thing is it was voluntary. So the child and the family could choose. You know, they could go to a school, right? There might be some private schools. There might be some inexpensive, cheap schools, some that were expensive. Or most, most of them just learned at home with their parents. And some went off to... At a certain age, they might go off to a, some kind of school, or others would go to religious schools, or others would go to learn how to do something, you know, like a, like to make things, or right. We call these trades, right? It's working with your hands. So there was a, just a huge variety of choice, and it worked really well. Then uh, he kind of goes back again to the problem with. Um, that the, you, you can really identify two, two big problems. One is schools, but the other one is television. Or we, I, I would say just media. He, this, he wrote this before the internet was big. So I would say, you know, because Netflix and all that stuff. But So I would just say more generally, media, especially video, and um, schools. He says, the problem is these two things, if you think about for most children, most kids, teenagers, young children, school plus TV or videos, that's most of the hours of the day. That eats a huge number of hours each day. Most kids are either at school or looking at videos or looking at the screen, right? Looking at TV or something. And because there's so many hours at school or watching videos and or video games, because of that, they don't have enough hours with their parents. And this is even worse because in many families, both parents are working. The family is weak. It's weak, weak, weak. There's not enough time. The connections between the children and the parents are being destroyed, have been destroyed, not are being. I mean, they are being too right now, but... This is already finished. It's done. It's sad. And that is the end. Woo! Those of you listening to my audio podcast, you know I talk about The Matrix, the movie. That was one hard red pill. <laughs> I feel like Neo waking up. Oh. In the real world, and it's not a nice world. But th those are some hard, ugly truths, and I agree with every one of them.
Mm. John Taylor Gatto hitting us with some very tough, hard truths. He's 100% correct. I agree. I really like this guy. I like him a lot. You know, in many ways, I followed his path. It's very similar. I, I was teaching in schools, not public schools, but I was teaching in language schools. Well, I taught, I taught in a few universities. And it was the same problem. I saw exactly all these things he's saying. I saw the same problems. And I just started feeling bad about it. I started realizing this is terrible. This is wrong. And that's why I left. That's why I started Effortless English. It's why now I support 100% homeschooling and uh, independent learning, independent education. The, the internet makes this very easy now for everybody. It doesn't matter. You're, it's good for children. It's good for adults too. This, on, this online education, uh, independent learning. The main thing is you're the master. The family, they're the masters of that education. It's much more effective. It's more human. It's 100% better in every way. So thank you, John Taylor Gatto. Strong. All right. Woo. I think I've said all I need to say. Let's go to some questions and comments. I saw people were typing some things while I was talking. So I'll, one second, I'll go read some comments and, and some of your questions. Hmm. All right, let's look at the reading glasses here. Okay, Nasser. Hello, hello. Hello, AJ, I'm Nasser. Hey, Nasser again. Uh, school methods are completely the opposite of effortless English method. Yes, I hope so. Their method is based on shallow and not deep learning. They teach us everything very fast with our eyes. The only thing that goes deep in our mind is unrealistic school mentality. Yes. And that's confusing people all the time. Confusion, right? That's what John Taylor Gatto said, that the methods of school teach confusion. My question is how to get rid of the school mindset. Good question. Okay. But see, he's right about that. Think about your English learning, right? All those uh, grammar, studying all those grammar rules, trying to memorize all those huge number of grammar rules. Did it help you speak better? No, it confused you. It created a lot of confusion for you. It actually hurt your speaking ability. See, this is what he's saying, that school creates confusion. Now, the question from Nasser, how to get rid of the school mindset? Well, by becoming an independent learner. You're doing it. You're doing it right now. Uh, well, number one, read books like this so you start to see the truth. That's always a good first step. See the truth. Understand it, at least uh, mentally. Reading a, So reading this book is a good first start. But then, of course, the second step, you have to change things internally in your mind, changing your beliefs, changing your mindset, and, uh, and then through actions and... You're doing it. You become an independent learner. If you're an adult, most of you are adults. Most effortless English uh, family members are adults. You should become a, an independent learner. You're, you're already now, right now, you're an independent learner of English. You're doing it right now. And you're getting success and you're improving. So you're changing it right now. So the, the key thing is, realize you're doing it with English now. So do it with everything. Do it with everything. That's what we were doing with about money and finances, right? As we read Robert Kiyosaki's book. As you become more independent financially, more free financially, you're doing the same thing. You're changing your mindset about money. You're getting rid of that school mentality of wait for someone to tell you what to do. And you're taking action. You're becoming your own master. You're learning independently. You don't need to go to school to learn that stuff. You can read books yourself, watch videos, start your own business, whatever you invest. You can do all of these things. You don't have to go sit in a school. So you just, that's all you do. You just do it. You do, you know, fitness again, fitness. That's a good one. You want to get fit. You want to get strong. Let's say you want to become like a bodybuilder, big muscle, strong. You're, you're not going to go to school to learn that, right? Nobody does that. What do you do? You probably get magazines and read uh, websites and read books uh, from other bodybuilders. 
and you know you'll find a huge amount of information and you maybe you're, you're not sure which one works so what do you of course what's the next thing you have to do you have to just get in the gym and start trying the different exercises trying the different methods trying the different ways of eating the different diets and you'll start experimenting and independently right you the master you deciding you you're getting information but you're the boss not no teacher telling you and then you finally you'll start to find things that are working for you and your muscles will start growing and you get better and better and better you'll teach yourself you will teach yourself bodybuilding that's how most bodybuilders do it they learn they teach themselves now, of course they talk to other bodybuilders and they read about it and they get information but mostly they get in the gym and they keep trying different things and you know a lot of i think a lot of bodybuilders will will tell you that uh each person, it's a little different. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, his his methods, his approach was a bit different than Lou Ferrigno's, and that's different than someone else, and someone else who wants to be a power lifter, which is a different kind of strength thing. They, they have some different methods. So you got to get in there. You got to find figure out your own body, right? But you do it independently. You get in there and you do it. That's how you do it. And this way, you gradually, step by step, in different areas of your life, you begin to change your mindset. And hopefully, I hope if you have children, you'll do this with education and you'll teach your own children. You'll get rid of this mindset that you have to send your kids off to some school, to people who don't know your child, who don't love your child, and you teach them. Or your husband or wife teaches them. Or your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad, whatever. Aha, uh -huh, yes. Walid says, I've been trying to figure out why schools don't teach people, young people, about real life. I couldn't figure it out until now. Now you know. <laughs> He's showing you why. They don't want you to. They don't want you to be independent and free. They want you to do what you are told. It's a system of control, and the school and the media are the kind of the two main parts. It's a prison for your mind, Neo. A prison for your mind. This is why I'm going, for my VIP members, this is why we have to do the Matrix. I'm going to do lessons with the Matrix. I'm going to do movie lessons, movie technique lessons for the Matrix. It's such a great movie. It is connected directly to what we're learning. In the last book and this book also. It's a prison for your mind. That's what it is exactly. So Walid, great comment. All right. Whoops. All right. Sukar. Sukar says, what is the best way to teach English? Is it to teach grammar in a lesson? No. And vocabulary is in another? No. Or is it better to make the lesson vary with different skills and each has a specific period during the same lesson? Uh, no, 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 and no. <laughs> no to all of those. The best way is... I'm just going to tell you a book to read because it's too long for me to explain it. Teaching. It's, it's TPR Storytelling. TPR Storytelling by Blaine Ray. TPR Storytelling by Blaine Ray. TPR Storytelling is the name of the book. Blaine Ray is the writer. Just get that book. That's the best way to teach English to, to kids, to beginners anybody even adults too it's the best way to teach adults tpr storytelling by blaine ray that's how you do it you don't teach grammar rules you don't teach grammar rules never you never do it not necessary you, you teach grammar you do teach grammar but you do it in a natural way using stories and other methods so it's 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 a great method TPR storytelling is great. You can also, there are other methods that are pretty good. TPR, total physical response, uses actions to teach uh, some, some grammar and vocabulary. Again, though, no grammar rules are taught. Uh, I like to use that sometimes, especially with low beginners. And there are a few other methods, but really just get that book because that's the best answer for anyone who's an English teacher. That's the way to do it. You can teach your own children using TPR storytelling. If you want to teach your own children English, that's the way to do it. 
if they're young children, there's an even better way. Just talk to them in English every day. That's the easy, easy, easy way. But if you're wanting a method, TPR storytelling is a good one. Okay, Long Kristen says, Hi, Jay. A lot of textbooks being used by schools suck. Yes, I'd say all. <laughs> they're confusing and boring. Yeah, and many, and many times they're even just wrong. They're just full of propaganda. They're not even correct. Uh, so do you know alternative ways to educate our children for subjects like math, science, or literature? Yeah, just read books. Read, 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 read. Go to the library and get huge numbers of books and read. I talked about this in my audio podcast today. You follow the child's natural curiosity. And if they're interested in something, you just get a lot of books about that topic. And, they, and you read them and you read them and you read them and you read them. And you, you can connect science to these topics. You can connect math to these topics. Uh, literature is easy. It's just reading. But I, wouldn't, I, don't, I don't think you should force literature too much. Encourage it, but don't force it. Right? If, you know, don't force your kid to read Shakespeare when they're 15 years old. I, there's no reason. I, unless they're interested. Unless they're interested. Now, for example, let's imagine, just for example, what if your child became interested in Rome, ancient Rome, you know, Julius Caesar and all that, the gladiators, all that cool stuff. Maybe, they, maybe your child sees the movie Gladiator, you know, they're, teen, they're 15 years old, and they see Gladiator with Russell Crowe, and they say, this is cool, wow, interesting. I want to learn more about the Romans. So what do you do? Go start getting books about the Romans. Rome, Rome, Rome. Get lots and lots and lots of books about the Romans. Read about the Romans. You could read about Roman um, history, uh, the military, Julius Caesar's book about the Gallic Wars. There's a huge amount you could you can read about their religion, philosophy. Oh, there's huge amounts of stuff. You could read the Aeneid, which is one of the classic, uh, probably the classic literature from Rome. You follow that interest that, that your child has about Rome, and then you just bring all that stuff in. That's how you could do it. You could even get bring math into it. Some of the, the, the mathematicians from ancient Greece and Rome. So this, this is how you do it. You, you're, you're working with your child's natural curiosity and interest, and then you bring in other things. And of course, there are you know, things you want them to learn, but you do that by encouraging them, and you connect the things you want them to learn, connect to what they're interested in. That's your job as the coach, as the parent. So you don't need special textbooks, really. Right. Instead of reading a textbook about Rome, read Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars commentary written by Julius Caesar. That's a way better. It's interesting, too. He's talking about the whole war in, in, in what now is France, right, against all these barbarians and all the battles and all these techniques he used and the politics. Read the direct book. Forget some textbook about it. Read what Julius Caesar himself wrote. And see, in this way, you could also connect some literature. If your child still, if they, they, they still were interested in Rome, then you could read Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar. Shakespeare has a play, Julius Caesar. See, now you're connecting Rome to English literature, to Julius Caesar, because he has the topic, right? You could create that natural connection. You could... Say, hey, wh let's read Julius Caesar. There's a Shakespeare play about Julius Caesar. It's all about him and, you know, when he got assassinated and all that. Let's read that. And then your child might actually say, oh, cool, yeah, let's read about Julius Caesar because I'm, I'm, I think I'm really fascinated by Rome. I'm reading all this stuff about Rome and Roman history. So now you connect it over. And then they read Julius Caesar. If they like it, then you could say, well, hey, do you want to read? Let's read more Julius Caesar play. I mean, let's read more Shakespeare. Right? This one was really cool. You could read another historical one, like, like Henry V. We've been talking about that on the audio podcast, right? Because it's kind of connected to Julius Caesar now, because first there's Rome. They're interested in Roman history. Then you read Julius Caesar, the play by Shakespeare. That's direct connection. Then they like that. So then you say, well, let's read more Shakespeare. How about Henry V, another famous leader? Another play with a lot of battles and fighting in it, right? Another historical Shakespeare play. 
And then you read Shakespeare's Henry V. And in that play, you learn about some famous battles, especially the Battle of Agincourt at, at the end of the play. So you can say, oh, what is this battle? Let's read it. Let's learn about the Battle of Agincourt. Let's learn about the history of this war between England and France. And who was Henry V? Who was this king? What did he do? Why were the French and the English fighting? And then you get into that history. Now you're into medieval uh, European history, specifically the Hundred Years' War. And you see, they just connect. This is natural learning. You're following these connections. And then it makes so much more sense in your child's mind, in your mind. And it's much more fun. Instead of just randomly forcing them to read stuff with no connection to anything. And then these connections go forever because everything is connected. Ultimately, everything is connected to everything else eventually. And in this way, your child will learn much more and much more deeply. They will enjoy it. It will be natural. You will enjoy it. It's so much better, so much more powerful. That's how you do it. Ah, yes, Fernanda says, I can see all of these truths in my son's school, my 11-year-old son. He just trusts the teacher's answers. Yeah, see, this is what they're learning. Just trust what the expert says. Don't question it. And the teachers only accept uh, their own thoughts, right? The teachers only accept their own opinion. If the child writes a different answer, even if it's a creative answer, even if it's even correct in a way, they'll get an X wrong because it's not the exact answer the teacher wants. It's what the teacher wants that's important, not truth. That's, the, that's what happens in schools. In this way, I'm kind of happy. I was, a, you know, I, was, I was a weird student. I was a strange student myself because on one hand, I was a very good student. I was smart. I got good grades. I found it easy. But on the other hand, I, I always saw it as a kind of game, and I, and I always kind of hated it because I, I hated that they were making it boring. I, I, I hated the whole idea of the grades and all that. I did it just so my parents would be happy. And then as I got older, I started to see that I, I, I stopped trusting the, the teachers. I started to see they weren't, they were wrong about different things. Looking back, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad about that. I'm happy that that happened because it allowed me to become more independent. Very, very dangerous for kids to learn just to accept answers without question without looking, without observing, without trying to find answers themselves. That's what you have to learn to be really uh, a great learner as an adult, to be successful in any part of life. You need to be aggressive. You need to go learn how to go find your own answers, not wait for someone to tell you. All right. Getting some. <clears throat> okay, Hasina. Again, hey, Hasina. Before I decided to learn English, I had the mindset that there are just a right or wrong because I saw, every, I saw it every day at school. Yeah, right. There's a right answer. There's a wrong answer. That's all. It's called binary thinking. It means two, thinking everything has only two answers. But when I searched for different online courses, I found Effortless English. I thought about education. It changed completely. I understood there are not just two ways to try something. You get a result. It doesn't matter if you failed. What matters is you learn and try again until you get a result that you like or want. Yes, that's right. This is another very uh, dangerous thing taught in schools that there's a right answer, there's a wrong answer. That it's The schools teach that in most things in life, you know, there's always right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. Two answers, right? Is it this or this, this or this? Or sometimes they'll give you A, B, C, D, right? But there's, it's very, very limited, the choices. But in many parts of, in many areas of life, I won't say all, but in many areas of life, there are many, 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 many possibilities. And it's possible to have more than one right answer. It's possible to have many right answers. Sometimes it depends on the situation. Sometimes it depends on the person, right? Sometimes something is good for me and not good for you. 
like for example, something simple like food. People have different body types. Some diets work are, are more healthy for one person, and maybe for another person, they're not, not so healthy. Right? Maybe one kind of person needs more protein, for example, and another doesn't because there's a big variety of people. So you have to find these answers yourself. It's not just right or wrong. It depends on the situation sometimes. And schools generally don't teach that. They're not, they don't teach flexible thinking or, or deep thinking. Okay. I'm going to look a little higher. Some people said, I wrote my comment up higher. All right, let me just go back up to the top of this list very quickly and see if I can find some comments. Hmm. <laughs> uh, Hun says, uh, Hi, AJ. An awesome opening of the book. So promising. I've been waiting for the book for so long. Yes, it's a great book. Really great book. Powerful book. I like I like his writing because he's so he's a strong writer. You know, he says things Ur! he doesn't hold back. He doesn't try to say them comfortably or softly. He's just Tow! say the truth and nothing but the truth. <laughs> uh, visit us in Gaza, AJ. We cook delicious food. <laughs> Someday. Thank you for the invitation. Okay, let's see what else. Okay, need to learning methods I feel. Okay, here's a quick question. It's not it's uh, uh Farzad says, "AJ, I need your advice. This is an easy one. I can answer this one quickly. I'm learning English with your method and I feel flu I feel fluency when I'm speaking English. Good job." And I today I decided to learn Spanish. Please help me. I have an answer for you. Unlimitedspanish.com. My good friend Oscar in Barcelona, Spain, has some excellent lessons, and he uses the Effortless English system to teach Spanish. If you want to learn Spanish, he's my favorite Spanish teacher, and his lessons are very good. Unlimitedspanish.com. Unlimitedspanish.com. And he uses the same, he uses that storytelling technique his stories are funny. It's really good. I used his lessons before I traveled in Spain. Uh, was, when was it? Three years ago. Three years ago, I did a trip in Spain. I was in Spain for two months, and I used his lessons just a couple of months. I only studied a couple of months before I went, and I, I did well. I did well in Spanish. I mean, not fluent, but I, I could get hotels. I could have some. Ba I had some basic conversations in Spanish. Uh, I had a great time, really fantastic. So unlimitedspanish.com. If you want to learn Spanish, that's who I recommend. All right, back to the bottom here. Let's see. Yeah, Chris, Kristen again. Long Kristen says, Schools also kill our curiosity. Yes, they do. Nowadays, many adults who just finished university don't want to learn. They all have a common mindset that learning is boring and excruciating, which means painful. Nice vocabulary word. They both lose their natural born curiosity. Yes, in the, I see this so much myself. You're right. I see this in the United States a lot where... I see it in Japan even, actually. I see it in Japan, too, where uh, after university, it's like they're just sick of, well, they're sick of school, which I understand. Of course they are. But the sad part is they're just sick of learning because they think learning and school are the same thing because that's what they're taught, right? They're taught from being from small children that school and learning are the same. They're not the same. They're not even close to the same. They're completely different. But unfortunately, sadly, so many young people have this idea that, you know, learning is school. And therefore, when they finally get out, when they finally get out of college, you know, finally get out of school, they don't want to do any learning anymore. This is, their, this is what they think. Oh, I'm sick of it. I'm finally free. Finally, I'm free. And they think, oh, learning is so boring. And their curiosity is dead. 
I, I remember I was teaching a uh, language school in San Francisco and I had students and, and a lot of them were that age, just after college. They had just finished university. Some of them, some of them just finished high school. Some had just finished university. But that's one of the key things I saw is how bored they were. They were so bored with um, learning. Anything connected to learning, they they just, uh, well, just like John Taylor Gatto said in the book, indifferent. Indifferent means don't care. Just like they just, they just didn't care. Like they could not get excited about learning anymore. They could not get excited about learning. The curiosity was gone. That natural human curiosity that is such a strong part of us, just gone. That's sad to me. For me, someone without curiosity is half dead. To me, it's like half of them is, has died. They're not fully human anymore. And that's what schools do. I think it's a tragedy. I think it's a horrible thing. Oh, so, uh, Kodir also recommends Dreaming Spanish on YouTube. I, I don't know about that, but okay. Thank you for the recommendation. I think it's about time for us to go. I think I'm almost finished. My voice is getting a little tired. I'm speaking emotionally today, using my voice a little more. Ah, Ramesh says, uh, hey, Ramesh, how are you doing? Uh, Savak. Today, I'm just listening. I have already read all the points before. Your lecture makes my understanding better. Well, thank you. That's why I do the book club. I encourage you to try to read the book, read it before or read it after. And then in the video, my job, I try to just review the most important points, explain them you know, using understandable English, simpler English. And I hope that will help you understand the book more and enjoy the book because I do want you to read the book. It's a great book. Uh, if you don't have it, I recommend get the book. It's called Dumbing Us Down, Dumbing Us Down by John Taylor Gatto. He has several books. He's got a great book about the history of education. I think it's called The Underground History of Education. Also great. But for now, get Dumbing Us Down. Get the book if you can. Kobo.com is a good place to get the book. Get the ebook. Ebook's good because you can just download it immediately. But I, I do. I want to support him because he's a really great, great guy. Great teacher. Okay. I think it's time to go. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed today's book club lesson. I did, as always. I always enjoy your comments and your questions, good comments and questions today. I love this book. You can tell I'm passionate about this book. I'm very, very, very emotional about this book I, because this book is really right at the center of what I do also. I am a huge supporter of independent education and homeschooling or home education and choice, having a wide number, a big number of choices in education. And I hate this in factory school system we have now around the world. I just hate it. it I think it's evil for all of the reasons John Taylor Gatto mentioned and for many more too. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to talk, don't we, we'll talk about the evils of the school system. And we'll also talk about a lot of better solutions and methods for real education to bring back that great natural human curiosity. It's what one of the great things about human beings is we're so naturally curious. We have this super strong, powerful desire to learn, 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 to learn all the time and to find the truth. This is so strong in us naturally. And the schools try to kill it, but it's inside all of us. And we need an education system that makes that stronger and it brings out the very best of human beings. All right. Next week, we'll do chapter two. Final thing. Remember, you know, I do only one video per week right now. One video per week. I do seven, seven audios per week. One per day. I do a new audio podcast, a new audio for you every day, every single day, seven days a week. So get my audio show. You need to get my audio podcast because that's my show. I mean, that's most of the Effortless English show now is my audio podcast. And you just go to uh, effortlessenglishclub.com right, right here on the screen and then slash podcasts with an S. 
Let's see. I'll put it on the screen. Effortless English Podcast. See if I can find it. EffortlessEnglishClub.com slash, right, slash podcasts. Uh, ah, well, I'll just tell it to you. Too slow to bring it up on the screen. EffortlessEnglishShow.com slash podcasts. Okay, so... Uh, subscribe to that podcast. Just get any podcast app. If you go to that that page, effortlessenglishclub.com slash podcasts, I have links to many different apps, different podcasting apps. It's a free show. It's free audio, free audio every day, every day. So that's seven times more than just the video. So don't miss it. <laughs> All right. EffortlessEnglishShow.com slash podcast. And of course, as always, join my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Lots of love to you. So excited to do this book. So excited about this topic. Hope you loved it too. And I'll see you again soon. Bye.